Jabatan Hak Ehwal Agama Islam Negeri Perlis, Jabatan Mufti Negeri Perlis, Institut Bayina serta Masjid Tuanku Said Putra Jamalul Lail Kanga. Ampun Tuanku, patut dengan segala hormat dan takzimnya mohon limpah perkenan dulu yang terpamu Tuanku untuk mengalu-alukan hadirin yang hadir pada malam ini. Yang berhormat Tuan Haji Nasruddin bin Abdul Muttalib, Pegawai Keuangan Negeri Perlis. Yang berbahagia, Major Kehormat Dr. Muhammad Mizan Muhammad Aslam, Rektor Kolej Universiti Islam Perlis. Yang berbahagia, Ustaz Haji Nazim Muhammad Nazim Muhammad Nur, Pemangku Ketua Pegawai Eksekutif MAIPS. Yang berbahagia, Dr. Hazman Hassan, Pengarah Jabatan Halewal Agama Islam Negeri Perlis Jaibs. Yang diraihkan, Ustaz Norman Alihan, penceramah kita pada malam ini. Tuan Imam Masjid Tuan Kusip Putra Jamalullah Al-Kanga Seterusnya tuan-tuan dan puan-puan Muslimin-Muslimat yang dirahmati sekalian Selamat datang ke Majlis Ceramah Umum Ustaz Norman Alihan Kepada semua, semoga kita mendapat keberkatan daripada majlis ilmu yang diadakan pada malam ini Ampun tuanku Selanjutnya, majlis dengan ini menjemput dan mempersilakan yang berbahagia Major Kehormat Dr. Ahmad Mizan Ahmad Aslam, Rektor Kolej Universiti Islam Perlis merangkap moderator pada malam ini bagi menopak sembah memohon limpah perkenan duli yang termak mula tuanku untuk meneruskan majlis pada malam ini. Dipersilakan. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim <coughs> Ampun tuanku Menghadap uh, duli yang teramat mulia Tuanku Syed Faizuddin Putra Ibni Tuanku Syed Sirajuddin Jamalulail Raja Muda Perlis Merangkap Tuanku Chancellor Kolej Universiti Islam Perlis dan juga yang dipetua Majlis Agama Islam dan Adat Istiadat Melayu Perlis Maibs serta duli yang teramat mulia Tuanku Hajah Lailatul Syahrin Akasyah Halil Raja Puan Muda Perlis Ampun Tuanku Sembah Patik Arab diampun uh, mohon izin limpah perkenan duli-duli Tuanku untuk Patik meneruskan uh, majlis pada malam ini Ampun Tuanku <coughs> Yang dihormati uh, Tan Sri Azmi Khalid Yang berhormat Tuan Haji Nasaruddin bin Abdul Muttalib Pegawai Kewangan Negeri uh, Yang berbahagia Ustaz Nazim Muhammad Noor Pemangku Ketua Pegawai Eksekutif MAIPS uh, Yang berbahagia Datuk, eh, Profesor Datuk Dr. Zul Azhar Zahid Jamal Naib Chancellor Unimem Yang berbahagia Dr. Hazman Hassan Pengarah Jabatan Agama Islam uh, Negeri Perlis, Jaibs uh, Dan seterusnya Yang diraihkan Ustaz Nauman Ali Khan uh, Imam Masjid Putra uh, Jamalulail Kanga, Perlis Dan hadirin hadirat yang dihormati sekalian Jadi <coughs> Saya diminta untuk menjadi uh, Moderator pada malam yang <coughs> Cukup berbahagia ini Dan uh, Mungkin saya akan selit-selit sedikit dengan bahasa Inggeris Because untuk meraihkan sebahagian daripada kita ni uh, Mungkin apa ni uh, Masih belum memahami bahasa Melayu Tapi saya akan uh, combinekan dua-dua ni Baik, jadi um, uh, Brother Norman and delegation Especially some of the Unimap students I also some see some students and lecturers Okay Uh, today we are delighted to have uh, our very prominent speaker okay but uh, especially come from United States of America okay um, now it's very different uh, it is uh, about 7:13 p.m. in Malaysia it is 7:30 a.m. in in the state of America right and then um, before i go further all right Uh, sebelum saya meneruskan I would like to share something uh, This is the reason why Noman Alihan is here today Okay, please 
at the screen, big screen. Uh, we did talk a lot about the foundation. A lot of you are watching this live on the foundation on bayina.org also. Um, th there are long-term lofty vision type stuff that I've shared with you before. I want to share with you what's gonna, what we're going to try to pull off in the next 12 months, inshallah. Uh, one of the things that I'm very excited about that I've made a commitment towards is that uh, within the next 12 months, I will be traveling to different parts of the Muslim world and capturing what I feel are inspiring stories. Uh, I think it's really important at a time of distress and hopelessness that we go around the ummah and we show people that are doing little things but they're amazing things. Like for example, one of the most imp like inspiring stories to me was my visit to a, a, the, 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 per, the state of Perlis in uh, Malaysia. Uh, and this state, uh, the, the, each of the states have a sultan, have a ruler, right? The sultan, uh, the sultan and his, his followers, like his entire government body, they literally get on bicycles this is a sultan, like a ruler, with a palace, like he's got a real palace, I've been to his palace. And he's got a museum, a family museum next to his palace, so this is legit. But they get on bicycles, 80, 90 of them, and they drive their bikes to the parts of the, the, the country that has no roads. And they literally knock on doors to find out if anybody's sick, or anybody needs help, or a child is okay, or if there was a death in the family. And they take record of people by checking on them, and then the, you know, they, they come at a Jum'ah prayer, the ruler is actually in the first row, and I gave the khutbah when I was there, and the sultan was in the first row, which is amazing that he's there. And then after that, they, made a, they called the people by name that they had checked on, and they had zakat checks ready for them. And they were just like every week, that's what they do. And as a result, because the, so they've done 90 bike runs in one year, the first year they did 72, the next year they did 90, I think they broke 100 this year. It's crazy. And I went there and I was like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. But how come I never knew? And if I don't know, a lot of people don't know. So I want to go with a film crew and actually film the whole thing. And just talk to people and show the beauty of Islam in this little part of the world. It's just so inspiring that that kind of stuff happens. Okay. <coughs> Alhamdulillah Itulah dia uh, Bukan perancangan kita sebenarnya Tapi lebih kepada kerja Allah SWT Yang telah tertulis di Lohul Mahfuz Untuk kita bertemu dan uh, dapat bersama-sama dengan Brother Ustaz Noman Alihan pada malam yang cukup berbahagia ini Brother Noman, Ustaz Noman um, Please come at the front Okay And I would like to read some of his uh, biodata before we go further. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Noman Ali Khan was born in May 4, 1978 in Berlin, Germany. He is a speaker, the CEO and founder of Bayina Institute, an Arabic studies educational institution in the States. His early education in Arabic started in Riyadh. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia and continued in Pakistan. His serious Arabic training began in 1999 in United States. He has been teaching modern standard and classical Arabic at various venues for several years with over 200,000 students nationwide. He set up the Bayina Institute in 2005 with two purposes. One is to, is to develop the, a curriculum for Arabic language to a standard that will help Muslim to learn Quran. And second, he understand the Muslims are disconnected from Quran and his institute will help them to reconnect going uh, beyond just removing the language barrier. Numan Ali Khan teaches about the religion of Islam through his video speeches. He also frequently speaks at Islamic Circle of North America Convention about Islam, family and other life topics. Noman Ali Khan touches subjects that others tend to avoid. This includes difficult taboos in the Muslim community, for example about drugs, about premarital sex, about politics and Islam. And he uses metaphors that everyone can relate 
too, and more important, has a sense of humor, right? Inshallah, he will continue his humor tonight. And his own use of language in the contemporary idioms breaks down the most complex of ideas into bite-sized and digestible concept. And with his trademark, actually, he always said, I don't give a lecture, I just a talk. Please, over to you, Ustaz. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض الملك القدوس العزيز الحكيم والذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد My intention this evening is to share with you some reminders for myself and for all of you from the Quran and this has been a very difficult challenge for me to speak in front of you today I first want to share with you why this was a difficult challenge most of the time when I speak to an audience, I'm speaking in the United States or I've spoken many times in Europe or I've spoken many times in places in the world where the Muslims are a minority. And when the Muslims are a minority, their challenges are different. And what they see around them, the environment is different. And when I come to a place like this, uh, it's a completely different world for me. Uh, and it's actually very empowering for me to experience because I'm not used to seeing Muslims not as the, as the uh, majority. I'm used to seeing us as the minority. And I'm used to seeing us not in a position of authority or a position of power, but really mostly in a position of weakness. So when you turn the equation and you look at, the, look at it from the other side, it's very difficult to first of all think, what is the message of Allah's book that a community like this one needs? So I had to do a lot of thinking about what message I want to share with you. And inshallah ta'ala, something that benefits myself and benefits all of you, because at the end of the day, the book of Allah is for all times and all people and all situations. What I want to start with today, inshallah, is a simple thing, tasbih. And hopefully I'll build this idea by the end, you'll see how all of it is connected. When Allah Azza wa Jal created human beings, the angels had a problem. And their problem was that human beings, when they will come on this earth, أَتَجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُوا فِيهَا Someone who is going to cause a lot of trouble. He's going to do a lot of fasad, a lot of corruption. And he's going to even kill. يَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاء He's going to spill blood. And dima is not a little bit of blood, it's a lot of blood. And safaka is used for rivers of blood. So not just a little bit of killing, a lot of killing will happen in the world. This is the concern of the malaika of the angels. And then they offer a solution. And the solution from the angels is, وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ And we in fact, we do your tasbih. The angels say, we do your tasbih. And we declare that you are... Al-Quddus, we declare that you are sanctified, you are pure. So on the one hand you have fasad, and on one hand you have killing, and on the other hand you have tasbih. And you would never think these two things are opposite of each other. Fasad and killing have to do with injustice, they have to do with corruption, they have to do with people stealing from each other, or robbing each other, or invading each other, or war. That's what fasad has to do with. That's for what safku dima has to do with. But tasbih has to do with subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. Tasbih has to do with dhikr inside the masjid. Tasbih has to do with salah. 
We begin our salah subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik in ruku' subhana rabbi al-azim in sujood subhana rabbi al-a'la. Salah is about tasbih. What does tasbih have to do with corruption? And there are so many places in the world where there's a lot of tasbih. In the, all over the Muslim world, we make salah. We do tasbih. And all over the Muslim world, there's a lot of corruption. And there's a lot of blood that's being spilled. So we don't think of, if you have one, if you have corruption, you will not have tasbih. Or if you have tasbih, you will not have corruption. That is just not the case. But when the angels spoke to Allah, they told him human beings are going to be a problem. And the real problem is they don't really have tasbih. Because we are the ones of tasbih. نَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ and it's almost as though the ishara, the implication here, is that if human beings were actually creatures of tasbih, if we did do subhanallah properly, then there would be no corruption. Then there would be no spilling of blood. Allah told them, inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamu. Now let me fast forward a little bit. Allah Azza wa Jal sent many prophets. And every time He sent prophets, it's the same message. Same message every time. And in a sense, you can say, it is also a message of tasbih. Because what is tasbih at the end of the day? What is subhanallah? Subhanallah is to declare that Allah is unique. And only Allah is perfect. It is another way of saying, La ilaha illallah, really, at the end of the day. And that is the message of all of the prophets. But the problem was, every time the prophets came and taught their message, the majority, the majority did not accept. The minority accepted. And even the minority that said La ilaha illallah, even the minority that did tasbih because they were taught by their prophets. Two, three, four generations later, same problem again. Because the next generations would forget. They would become weak. They would lose some of the teachings. And eventually they would fall back into shirk again. They would forget about subhanallah again. Allah would send another prophet. And he would fix the problem for a small minority. And then they would continue. And then the problem came back again. And it came back again and again and again and again. This continued to happen throughout history. If one prophet was successful in his own time when he was alive, then you cannot say that 500 years later is still successful. Because the future generations failed. So when I look at a community like this one, before I go on, Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, there's something beautiful happening here. There's Islam here. Our children are saying, La ilaha illallah here. Our masajid are here, or they're full here. But we have to think about 500 years from now. We, have to, we can't just think about right now. We have to think what's gonna happen later on. When this problem continued, you come all the way down to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ibrahim alayhi salam understands this problem. He's a genius, he understands this problem. So when Allah gave him the opportunity to ask, because he made him imam over all of the people, inni ja'iluka lil nasi imama. Ibrahim alayhi salam asked about the future generations. Wa min dhurriyati. What about my children and their children and their children and their children? Because he understands what happens in history. The children forget. The children fall into shirk. And Allah told him that even his children, some of the, most of them will forget. لا ينالوا عهد الظالمين My children, the, the, the promise, the guarantee does not go to them. Even your children, the, the promise, the guarantee does not extend to them. And so we get the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which goes back to the tasbih of the angels actually in my opinion. The dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam was, send them a messenger, you know, وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ Appoint, raise a messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam among them يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He will recite your revelation to you. This is a dua about Muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I won't explain the, the, the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but I want you to understand something. Allah told Ibrahim alayhi salam that the future generation will have a problem. He told him already. And Ibrahim alayhi salam knows this already. And after knowing this, he asked for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
And Rasulullah is described with these four things. What will he come and do? يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He will come and he will recite your, revel- your ayat, Qur'an. He doesn't know it's called Qur'an. We know that it's called Qur'an. That, that happened thousands of years later. He'll teach them the book and the wisdom. He will purify them. These simple words, Ibrahim alayhi salam understands something. If he can do that successfully, then they will take it and give it to their next generation. And they will take that and give it to their next generation. And they will take that and give it to their next generation. Which is why Ibrahim alayhi salam, I would imagine, you could think he would ask Allah for one messenger for every generation. Because that's guaranteed, you'll no problem. Every, every, every new generation, every 30, 40, 50 years, there's a new Rasul. Problem solved. But he didn't ask for Rasul. He didn't ask for messengers. He asked for just one messenger. Just one. And he knows what happens when you send just one messenger. A few generations later, everything is forgotten. But he asked not just for any messenger, he asked for a special messenger. A kind of messenger who will have a unique, a different mission than every other messenger before. And this messenger, his mission is so powerful and so unique that if, he, if people learn his mission and the way he carried his message, then the next generations will be safe. They will not lose their Islam. They will continue to grow and grow and grow and grow in their Islam. But they will have to hold on to the same formula. If they forget that formula, they will lose. We can hold on to Islam for 1,400 and more years. Easy. But we can lose it in 20 years. We can lo- if we forget this formula, it'll be gone in no time. It'll be completely gone. And so, I go back. The angels said, نَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ And نُسَبِّحُ is... What's called al-fi'l al-mudari in the Arabic language, the present tense, which means not only do we do tasbih right now, we will continue to do tasbih. So it's not just right now, we have a commitment, we'll keep on doing tasbih. And human beings, they'll do it now, they'll forget later. They'll, they'll get weak later on. What does Allah Azza wa tell us about the entire world, the entire existence? In Surah Al-Jum'ah, He says, يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Al-Maliki Al-Quddus Al-Aziz Al-Hakim I won't emphasize everything about this ayah, I just want you to notice one thing. Allah says everything in the skies and the earth does tasbih right now and will continue to do tasbih. Tasbih will continue to go on. The declaration of Allah's perfection will happen in the skies and in the earth and it will keep on happening. If all of the human beings are alive or if all of the human beings are dead, tasbih of Allah will continue. The tasbih of Allah does not need you and me. It will continue. But there's something special about this beginning because Allah is talking about the tasbih of Allah continuing. Not just stopping, but continuing. And when He mentions this, in the next ayah, he mentions Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he mentions how will the messenger fulfill his mission that will keep tasbih of Allah going. He, Allah is the one who sent among the ummiyeen, he sent among the unlettered people, you can call them the uneducated people, the uncivilized people even. They have no big buildings, they have no big roads, they have no castles or palaces. They have no good economy. They have no oil yet. You know? <laughs> they have nothing. All they have is sand and rocks. That's all they have. He sent a messenger among them. And what does he do among those people? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He recites unto them his ayat. This Quran. You know, today in the world you have universities, you have big cities, you have civilization, you have modern life. And then you had this desert and tents and mud homes. That's all you had. And the Qur'an came in those te- to those tents and those mud homes. That's where it came. And that Qur'an is now still the guidance for the most modern cities and the most modern civilizations. The newest of civilizations. This is the miracle of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
what started in the most uneducated place in the world. This is the, you could argue the most uneducated place in the world. Even next door to them is the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And those people have poetry, they have learning, they have philosophy, they have those things. For thousands of years they have those things. And the Arabs had nothing. They just had their shi'ir and they had their, their, their lugha and that's all they had. They didn't even have a big building. <laughs> they didn't even have that. And Allah Azza wa Jal chose those people. You know, لِتُنذِرَ قَوْمًا مَا أُنذِرَ آبَاؤُهُمْ Allah describes, you, will, you, will, you came to warn some nation whose fathers weren't even warned. For at least other nations, they had prophets before and other prophets before and other prophets before. Since Ismail alayhi salam, the Arabs had nothing. But Allah changed those people because of this messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And He brought a change. This mess, what I'm trying to say to you, is this Qur'an and this change that the Prophet brought is enough to transform a society and if it's powerful enough to change a society so much it's powerful enough to keep that change my concern for a place like in the, in the Ummah like a, a, a beautiful place like Perlis or a beautiful country like Malaysia or the Ummah like you know all over the Ummah my concern is not only what is happening right now how do we keep this Ummah first of all how do we restore this Ummah and how do we keep it strong? The first step of it according to Allah that the Prophet did, that we must do sallallahu alayhi wa that we must do is yatlu alayhi mayatihi. He would recite onto the people his ayat. We have to restore the connection with the ummah of the Qur'an. The ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has to feel a bond, a relationship with the Qur'an. So in every home, in every masjid, in every gathering of friends, somebody is reminding somebody of the ayat of Allah. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. And this is, you don't say, oh, I already know what Quran says. It's not like that. This Quran is different. It's not like any other book. Every time you remind, it does something inside you. It gives you a new life. It, re it restores you. Ida da'akum lima yuhyikum. When he calls you to what will give you life. It's as though our heart starts dying and then you hear something from the Qur'an, it comes back to life again. And then it starts dying and you hear something from the ayat of Allah and it comes back to life again. So it's not like you say, oh, I already know this surah. I already heard this ayah. No, 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 no. But your heart is dying. It needs to be brought back to life again. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He recites onto them his ayat. And this is something that is not just, it's, of course it's the job of the imam. Of course it's the job of the mufti, it's, of course it's the job of the khatib, but it's also the job of the mother, of the father, of the older brother, of the sister, in the family, among the friends, in the college, in the university, when you're sitting in a restaurant, in every, every opportunity possible, you share with each other something about the word of Allah, something about what it means. And I'm talking about a, when, when we say, yatlu alayhim ayatihi, it's important to understand, that we're not just talking about you just recite something. And people are just sitting there listening. No, not just that. Because for a lot of people, they don't understand. They don't understand what Allah said. We don't just recite the word of Allah. We share the meaning of the word of Allah. The lessons in the word of Allah. That is yatlu alayhi mayatihi. The wisdom, the advice from the word of Allah. That is what brings the heart back to life. That will restore, and, and it does two things. I, I emphasize the heart, but there's one more thing. It changes the way the Muslim thinks. I can tell you, Wallahi al when I travel, I realize something. Muslims love the Qur'an. We love the Qur'an, every one of us. But we don't think like the Qur'an. We forgot how to think like the Qur'an. The Qur'an, the more you listen to it, and that's true, if you have a friend, you listen to him all the time, he changes the way you think. If you spend time with people, and you listen to them constantly, they, inf they influence the way that you think. If you're listening to Qur'an, and the message of the Qur'an all the time, it changes the way you think. It changes the way you think about yourself, it changes the way you think about your neighbor, it changes the way you think about money, it changes the way you think about the future, about your children, it, it changes everything. And every time your thinking goes back, you hear more Qur'an and your thinking is become better again. 
This is why the Quran keeps saying, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ So that you can think, so you can understand. Quran is not just about ilm or knowledge. Quran is about thinking, reflecting. And this is something that you have to do over and over again. You know, even knowledgeable people, sometimes they just stop thinking. And then somebody reminds them and say, Oh yeah, I haven't thought about that in a long time. <laughs> Their thinking can become rusty. Just because you have a, a muscle, doesn't mean you're exercising that muscle. Quran is a means by which that muscle is exercised. We're constantly engaged and re-engaged in thinking about the word of Allah. And that's when you understand the next words, وَيُزَكِّهِمْ And by doing so, He purifies them. He cleans them. What does He clean? The Quran, when you hear it all the time, it starts cleaning your heart. It, it starts cleaning things like jealousy. It starts cleaning things like greed. You know, you have sometimes in your life, in my life, there are arguments or there is a problem. And you have a problem in your family or somebody's not listening to you, your son is not listening to you and you have a big problem at home or the husband and the wife are not getting along is a big problem or there's a problem in the business or something. There's some issue that you're having in your life. And this, this issue becomes so big. You're always thinking about it. You're going to sleep depressed thinking about it. You wake up thinking about it. You're talking to everybody in your family about it. It's always on your mind until you start hearing Qur'an more and more and more again. And what happens? You realize that big problem is actually a very small problem. It's not that big of a problem. مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ there's no problem that ever strikes you, there's no calamity, there's no great difficulty that will ever hit you, except it's from Allah's, you know, Allah's uh, permission. And you just become, oh, وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ Whoever can have iman in Allah, Allah will guide their heart, or will put your heart at ease. This is, this is yuzakihim. You were depressed about your problem and all of a sudden it's not that big of a problem anymore. You were so angry at someone. You're, every time somebody says their name, you're like, Tuh! Get so angry when you hear their name and now because of Qur'an, your heart is not angry anymore. The anger is gone. The, 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 the jealousy is gone. The memory is gone. You're thinking about much more important things. You're thinking, I'm, I think this is the worst problem. I'm gonna stand in front of Allah soon. This is nothing, not worth it, not worth my time. What Allah does is, you know, they say in Arabic, كَبِّرْهَا تَكْبُرْ تَصْغِرْهَا You know, صَغِرْهَا تَصْغُرْ When you make something a big deal, it becomes a big deal. When you make something no big deal, it becomes a small problem. What does Qur'an do? Qur'an comes and gives you balance. What is worth making a big deal? What is worth keeping a... If something deserves to be small, then Qur'an will make it small. And something deserves to be big, Qur'an will make it big. And your thinking will become prioritized. This is yuzakkihim. Not only in the sense of our hearts, but in the sense of our minds. The Qur'an's tilawa does one more thing. About, about tazkiyah I want to share with you. It will constantly remind you why this is the word of Allah. You know, over time, you find in Qur'an, Allah says, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْهُمْ مُرِيبٍ Generations that came afterwards, next generation, next generation, those who inherited the book from their parents, they became doubtful. They started having shak. I mean, we follow this religion, but you know, the Buddhists, they also follow their religion. And the Hindus, they also have their religion. And the Christians, they also have their religion. There's so many religions. And they follow their religion because their parents gave it to them. And we follow our religion because our parents gave it to them. So maybe ours is okay, but I don't know, maybe theirs is okay too. Because we all got it from our parents. It's maybe if I was born in a Buddhist family, if I was born in a Hindu family, I would have been Hindu. You know, I wonder which one is right. <laughs> you start having, the next generation starts having doubts. The, the solution to those doubts is, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِ مَيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّهِمْ When from the early age going on, you are teaching children how to think. And you're exposing them to the word of Allah. They're not only learning how to make salah, and what, what dhikr to make. They are learning why. The most important question, why are they Muslim? We are not Muslim because our parents are Muslim. 
We are Muslim because it's al-haq. It's the truth. And it, the tilawa of the ayat, the message of Qur'an, when it's constantly being repeated, it shows you why this is the truth. حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ Until it becomes clear to them, it's the truth. Every time you hear it, زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا It increases them even more in iman. They are even more convinced it's the word of Allah. Wallahi al-Azim, I've been trying to understand the Qur'an. It was mentioned in the introduction. I've been trying to understand the Qur'an since 1999. And I've, I've been study, I'm still a student of the Qur'an. And sometimes I'm studying Qur'an and I just have to stop and say, Kalamullah. Like I just, this can only be from Allah. I have that all the time when I study it now. Why? Because that's the promise of Allah. He will purify your thinking and refresh your iman and remove your doubts. And when you don't have this, when you don't do yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim, you know, كَمَا هِيَ السُنَّةَ لِلنَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ Just like the legacy of the Prophet ﷺ. If we don't do this, you know what happens? Then you get a new generation of Muslims, they have questions. I don't understand salah, what is the point? Why is it these five different salahs? And what's the point of zakat? I don't understand why we have halal, haram, what's the big deal? They start having doubts about everything. They start questioning everything. Nothing makes sense to them anymore. And you know when those questions come? When there's a distance between the Ummah and the Qur'an, then the questions come. And when the, when, the, when the connection is there, then the questions are answered in the best way by Allah Himself. So you never even feel the need to ask the question because it's been convincingly answered before you even ask the question. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He then says, this is the last two parts and these are different. So this first part was different, the last part is different. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Allah Azza wa Jal could have just said, "Yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim," and or he could have said, "Yatlu alayhim al kitab, yatlu alayhim al hikma." He reads the book to them. He reads the wisdom to them. No, he says he teaches the book. He teaches the book. He teaches the wisdom. So there's a different verb now. It's different from yatlu. So first I'd like to, to help you understand the difference between yatlu in the beginning and yu'allimuhum. Now, yatlu, yatlu alayhim suggests there's a public audience. And you just recite to them. You make things easy for them to understand. Some of them are students, some of them are not students. Some of them can only listen for two minutes, some of them can listen for two hours, no difference. It's open-ended invitation. This is what the Rasul of Allah did sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even for the Quraysh. They're not students. They're not there to learn. But even on them, yatlu alayhim ayatihi. Even on them. You know, this is actually, in a sense, the first two, ayah, first two parts of this ayah are like da'wah. They're like da'wah. Because da'wah, somebody will listen and somebody will not listen, but doesn't matter, you try to give anyway. Sometimes you say, you, among your friends, you share something about the Qur'an, some of your friends don't want to hear anything, it's okay. Something went in their ear, and maybe six months from now, it'll grow inside their head. But maybe they won't listen right then, it's okay. This is yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakkihim. But now we're in a different phrase. We're in yu'allimuhumul kitaba wal hikmah. Ta'aleem is two things. There's the mu'allim and there's the muta'allim. There's the teacher, And there's the student. And they both have to put a lot of effort. It doesn't come without effort. Ta'aleem cannot happen easily. Like right now when you're sitting here, this actually is not ta'aleem. This is more closer to yatlu alayhim ayatihi. This is closer to that. And may Allah accept it as that. But when you say allama, then you're saying the teacher makes a lot of effort, checks on every student, they gauge their progress, Did you understand? Did you understand? Did you un- and he repeats and he reviews and he tests. And the student is taking notes and studying and he's asking questions and he's memorizing and he's learning and he doesn't understand something. He comes back to the teacher and there's constant back and forth and it takes a long time. When you teach anything, it takes a long time. Allah Azza wa Jal says about the law of this deen. Al-Kitab here is a reference to the Sharia in Quran. Many times the word kitab is used in the meaning of the law. Kitab Allahi alaykum, the book of Allah, meaning the law of Allah. 
mandated upon you. Similarly, the law of fasting is kutiba alaykum siyam, right? So, kitab is used many places in Quran for the meaning of law. And so Allah says He teaches them the law. What does that mean? That the sharia of Islam, the law of Islam, you cannot just hear about it and you understand it. There is the message of Islam that's different. The ayat of Allah, different. You can just hear about them and maybe you'll still benefit. But the law of Islam, the ahkam of Islam, the mandate of Islam is serious. And you have to seriously learn to understand it because this is actually very dangerous. You know, uh, if you go to court, you better have a good lawyer. And a good lawyer is someone who spent a lot of serious time understanding the law. But you're not going to hire someone who says, Hey, yeah, I listened to the law on the radio. I just heard it one time. I'll take your case. <laughs> when it comes to the law, you need to have people that really seriously study the law. Serious, deeply understand the law. Why? Because the law, maybe it applies in one case, but it doesn't apply in another case. Maybe it's for this group, but it's not for this group. If you don't understand it deeply, even for a judge, one case comes, he says guilty. Another case comes, he says not guilty. And the, for the outsiders, it looks like the same case. It's like the same, same exact case. Why is he saying guilty, not guilty? Because you don't understand the law. There's a different situation here and different situation there. If, you expla if he explained it in detail, you would understand. Why I say this is because today people talk a lot about sharia, about halal and haram. And I can, I can tell you, even the Muslims, most of the time when we talk about halal and haram, we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know. We just heard something. We didn't really learn it. We just heard something and we repeat it. The genius of the Qur'an and the genius of Ibrahim السلام, and finally the, the wisdom of Allah Azza wa He mentions, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ He teaches them the law. Which means, we're gonna have to go to the fuqaha, the ulama, the people that study the law and, and spend their lifetime studying the law. And we're gonna have to learn from them. And if you really want to understand it, then you have to become a student. If you don't understand some hukum, some, some ruling in sharia, and you say, it doesn't make sense to me, then you have to become serious. Then you have to become a student to understand it. That's just the nature of the law. But even then, even then, the law alone is a problem. There was a nation before us, they were also given the law. Banu Israel, they were also given sharia. They were also given halal and haram. Quran talks about them all the time. And that nation, Unfortunately, what happened was their entire Islam was just the law. For them, Islam was just halal and haram and fard and that's it. That's all it was. So they, they made two things equal. Islam equals sharia. Islam does not equal sharia. What is happening in this ayah? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. That's not the law. Wa yuzakihim. That's not the law. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ That's the law. And then الْحِكْمَةَ at the end, that's still again not the law. The law is part of Islam, but it's not all of Islam. It's not all of Islam. What happens in the ummah, when we forget this teaching of the Qur'an, we go around trying to implement the law of Islam. Force people to accept the law of Islam. Tell people, this is haram, you cannot do this, or this is, this is fard, you have to do this, etc. And the people say, why? Why should I do it? I don't want to do it. You know why they ask why? Because yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakihim hasn't happened. You cannot just go straight to the law. There's a process, step one, step two, step three. That's what Quran is teaching us. You want the law in the land? You want the law to be followed by the believers even? Even the Muslims? Then first you have to follow the steps. And even if you're following the law now, how will you make sure the next generation will love the law? Not just follow the law, love the word of Allah. Love the ahkam of Allah. Because if we don't love what Allah gave us, if we, if we follow it and we don't like to, if we follow it, we don't like to. That's called nifaq. يُنْفِقُونَ وَهُمْ كَارِهُونَ They spend but they hate it. What's the point? 
If we don't do, if we don't, if we don't love salah, if we don't love zakah, if we don't love halal, then there's no point. And so how do you instill that love is those first two steps. But now I get to hikmah. Well, you allimuhum al kitab wal hikmah. Hikmah is many things. I just want to highlight a couple of quick things for you. The first of them is hikmah means in the, the way in which you will do the kitab, meaning apply the kitab. The, the, the faqih, the judge, the ruler, the imam, even the head of the household, when he's going to make a judgment according to the kitab, he, use, he needs to use a lot of wisdom. He cannot just, this is the rule, that's it. Wisdom will have to be applied. So that's one easy implication of al-hikmah. But the other interesting meaning, there's lots of meanings of al-hikmah. Hikmah, what I could share with you here today, how does the Qur'an talk about hikmah? And if you really want to understand this, I will give you two words. And you have to remember the comparison between these two words and inshallah ta'ala we're done. The first word is the law, I've been talking about that. And the second word is morals. Morals. You have for example, there's a law, there's a red light on the street. When you get to the red light, you have to stop. That is the law. If you keep going, you broke the law. The law is basically yes or no, black or white, halal or haram, it's very clear. And when you break the law, there is punishment. That's the, that's the nature of a law. If, if you broke a law and there is no punishment, then it's not a law. You see, if the red light, you stop there, and you keep going, and nobody says anything, the policeman says, mm, okay, but next time, okay, just be, be nice next time. Or it says on the side, please, please stop here if you're a nice person. But if you don't stop here, shame on you, but there is no police. Nobody will stop. Because a law is not respected until there is what? Some, some kind of authority. That's, that's the nature of the law. But morals are different. Hikmah is different. Hikmah is for example in Quran, وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا don't walk on the earth with, with pride. Don't walk with pride. There's, that's not a law. I can't walk a certain way and the police comes, Hey, walking with pride. Here's fine. <laughs> you can't do that. That's not a law. It's a moral. Allah says, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Be the best you can be to your parents. So you came and you said salam to your parents and the police officer says, you should have said better salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, ihsanan. Here's another fine, 50 ringgit. That's not a law. It's a moral teaching. You know, Allah says in Quran, He says in, in ayat wasaya Luqman, Luqman gave his son hikmah. Wa laqad atayna Luqman al-hikmah. And he gave that hikmah to his son. And he says it to his son, you know, waghdud min sawtik, lower your voice. The ugliest sound is the sound of a donkey. Lower your voice. Lowering the voice is not the law. I'm raising my voice right now. Right? That's not the law. And you can't say, you're sitting in a restaurant, you say, Hey! And then the Sharia police comes and says, 50 ringgit, Inna ankara laswati lasawtul hamir. And you get a donkey sticker. I, 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 <laughs> No, there's a difference. Islam gave us two things. Islam gave us laws, and actually very few laws. And Islam gave us a lot of morals, a lot of hikmah. This is what Allah gave you out of wisdom. Now wisdom is a few things. The iman that we have, iman in Allah, iman in the akhirah, iman in Rasulullah wasallam, iman in all of the Rasul, iman in the ghayb, that's all part of hikmah also. That's also hikmah. And then the moral teachings are also hikmah. And we're learning now that you cannot just learn the law. You have to learn the law and the morals. You have to learn the law and the, the, these other teachings together. And that's why they're combined. يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ You know, a lot of times people have a question. And nowadays, people, the way people ask a question is very interesting. Especially young people come and ask a question. They'll say, is Facebook haram? Or is, is uh, you know, our movies haram, is music haram, is... Every question, haram, 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 haram. 
That's, and if you say, well, let's talk. No, 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 just tell me haram or not. And then because it's the law, it's complicated. It needs a complicated answer. They're like, oh, so it's not haram, which means it's halal. <laughs> you know? You know, a lot of times it tells you that we think only in terms of the law. Like Islam, all it is is the law. You know? And has nothing to do with wisdom. That these questions are not about kitab. They're actually about what? Hikmah. A lot of these questions are about hikmah. Some, some girl came to me one time. Her mother said she goes out with her friends all the time. She doesn't listen to me. So she says, the girl says to me, is, is having friends haram? And I said, okay, let's sit down and talk. I said, are you allergic? And she said, yes, I have allergy to peanuts. I said, here, have some peanuts, I'll get you some peanuts. No, 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 I'm allergic. I was like, but it's not haram. Eat it. Peanuts are haram or no? You can eat them. Why aren't you eating them? That's a bad idea. She says, that's a bad idea. I was like, exactly. Sometimes something is not haram, but it's still a bad idea. <laughs> that's called hikmah. Not all of Islam is law. A lot of Islam is, here's a good idea, here's a bad idea. Don't be arrogant when you walk, that's a bad idea. Don't raise your voice at people when you're having a normal conversation, that's a bad idea. It's wise to keep your voice low. Deal with your parents in the best way, this is a good idea. And if you don't do that, that's a bad idea. That's hikmah, it's, a, it's the higher kind of common sense. So this is the practical map of the religion that was given to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this when you teach it this way notice where it began though you don't begin with hikmah you begin with yatlu alayhi mayatihi why it's all one last time i'll share with you why and add some new things you begin with yatlu alayhi mayatihi because with yatlu alayhi mayatihi the iman is is calm now you know this is from allah you don't question that anymore now you're ready to listen and now that because إِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِ مَيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا When ayat are recited, the ayat are read on to them, it increases them in their iman. When that happens, now they're ready to become more and more purified. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Now it's time to teach the law. And by the way, the alim will learn the law at this level. But the child will have to be taught the law at this level. Whatever they need. Our children, they need to learn the law of regarding how to pray, how to eat, how to purify themselves. They need to learn that part of the law. The alim has to learn the law of mu'amalat even, how to do the judgment between the people, how to do the qada between people. They have to learn the law at a different level. Not everybody has to become a faqih. You, so there's a minimal amount of law that you need, that I need, that we have to learn. And then there's higher and higher and higher levels. But hikmah is for everybody. And even hikmah is at different levels, right? The hikmah for a child is something else. Like Luqman gave advice to his son. The hikmah for, for the elders is something else. Hikmah for the elders is how do we talk to our young people? We need hikmah in how we talk to our young people, you know? And so this beautiful map of religion has been given to us. What I, when I thought about this place, and I, it was shared in the video before, I'm so grateful that I got to fulfill that ambition. And I'm so, my, my team is also so grateful. We came here and we went on the bike run with, with Tuanku. Uh, I'm so honored to be a part of that. And, and, and so very grateful to really partake in that act of ibadah that we did. I was telling the group earlier, all over the world I get to see Aqimu Salah. And here I came, I got to see Atul Zakah. You know, it's, it's, it's just a beautiful thing to be able to live and see. And may Allah bless this, the, the Ummah and especially the people here for what, what's happening here. What I thought about was, again, what's going to happen 300 years from now, 500 years from now? And how are we going to make this the strongest part of the Ummah? We can do that only if we create a culture where Qur'an is being taught and learned in every circle. Every circle, every family, every masjid, 
every women's circle, there's some halaqah of Qur'an, there's some halaqah of tafsir, there's some halaqah, some circle where people are going, يَتَدَارَسُونَ أَبُهُ بَيْنَهُمْ They're sitting among each other and they're just studying the book of Allah. Like the Prophet ﷺ describes when people do that. Any home of Allah, any house of Allah, فِي بَيْتٍ مِنْ بُيُوتِ اللَّهِ When they're sitting there and learning the book of Allah, إِلَّا نَزَلَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ You know, angels come down. حَفَّتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ حَفَّتْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Angels surround them. And tranquility, peace descends on them. You know, and this is important to understand because it goes back to the, the word of the angels. The angels said that we, they will cause, they will spill blood and do corruption and we do tasbih. We do tasbih. And here we are, the best of all tasbih is the Qur'an. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْعَلَىٰ فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ The best subhanallah, the best tasbih is the word of Allah. And when we do that, peace comes on us. And when you have sakina, you cannot have fasad. When you have sakina, you cannot have safkud dima. You know? This book will protect not only your personal life, it'll protect the ummah itself. I tell people, a lot of times you know, we have, when you have a problem, people do ruqya, and they recite Qur'an. I argue that ruqya is truly effective when you recite Qur'an with understanding. It's truly effective when you recite Qur'an and you understand what Allah is saying. That's when it protects you. That's when it offers that protection. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make this Qur'an, like Allah says about it, لَا, لا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَلَن تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ مُلْتَحَدًا About the kitab, he says, وَتْلُ مَا أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ مِن كِتَابِ رَبِّكَ لَا مُبَدِّلَ لِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَلَن تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ يعني مِن دُونِ الْكِتَابِ مُلْتَحَدًا He will not find any protection, anywhere to hide, anywhere to stay safe, other than the kitab of Allah, other than the book of Allah. So what will keep this ummah safe is this formula given, of, given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that formula is one of really injecting the message and the reflection and the understanding of the Qur'an deep inside the hearts and the minds of this ummah. May Allah azza wa jal make the state of police and the people here a model of that. And an example of that for others to follow. And may Allah azza wa jal make the ummah all over once again deeply reconnected with the book of Allah. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم Thank you very much, uh, Ustaz Noman Ali. This is a very good sharing session. There are lots of things to share. Uh, banyak banyak uh, manfaat, banyak uh, isi isi yang uh, kita boleh dapati dan kita telah dapati ya. Uh, Pelbagai lah, uh, Brother Noman menceritakan tentang uh, Quran, eh, bermula daripada zaman Nabi Ibrahim, kemudian cerita tentang hikmah. Uh, cerita tentang apa ni undang-undang dan akhir sekali uh, secara conclusion yang saya dapat ialah uh, penekanan oleh Brother Numan Alihan tentang menyuburkan budaya Quran eh, Quran di dalam masyarakat kita apabila Quran itu dibaca uh, dan dihayati serta uh, subur di kalangan semua masyarakat di semua tempat negara ini dan Negeri ini akan mendapat keberkatan dan juga kerahmatan daripada Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala Insya Allah. Baik. Um, selain daripada itu, kita beri peluang untuk hadirin uh, me- me- menanyakan apa-apa soalan. Jadi kita buka dua soalan sahaja oleh kerana kekangan masa. Okay. Jadi I would like to open the floor for any questions. So we allow for two questions. Alright. Uh, this is the first one I can see here. Okay, brother, please. Uh, maybe uh, Tansri, the second one. Okay, please. You are the first one. Okay, come. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Ustaz Noman. Uh, my question is about Yatlu Alayhim Ayatihi. Uh, here, actually, uh, I, I heard from, uh, I heard it, and I, what can I understand from the outer meaning? That just uh, ayatihi means the ayat of Allah. 
So does it al always refer to Quran or anything that is the, that reminds Allah that can be a sign to prove Allah? All these things can be included in ayatihi or only Quran. Ah, good question. Yes, yes. yes. Tell us your. Tell us your uh, I am Taufiq Muhammad Hussain from Bangladesh, uh, UNIMAP student, masters. Thank you. Uh, great question, Taufiq. Uh, is the word ayat in yatlu alayhim ayatihi referring only to the Quran, or is it referring to you know you know all things outside? Because everything is ayat. At the end of the day, the creation of Allah is also ayat, and history is also ayat. Uh, I would argue that there are places in the Qur'an that have to be determined, the meaning has to be determined by the context. And the context of this ayah is, it's a response to the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam was specifically about a messenger who will come and recite Allah's revelations. He will recite what will, what, what will be revealed to him. And so, I would argue that in this particular case, the, the, the primary meaning is revelation or Qur'an itself. You can extrapolate secondarily, maybe it includes other things, but I would stick with the, the primary meaning. And that's further elaborated in يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ It's actually building on the same notion, the different roles that the Qur'an plays. The Qur'an plays the role of ayat, it plays the role of tazkiyah, it plays the role of ta'limul kitab, it plays the role of ta'limul hikmah. It plays all of those different roles, because it's not one thing. Quran cannot be reduced to one thing. It plays multiple functions, and all of them have been described. Some of you might know that the word hikmah is also described, like Imam Shafi'i, very famous statement, that the word hikmah is the sunnah of the Prophet. So it's kitab and hikmah, meaning Quran and sunnah, right? And even though that's a very, that, it's, a, it's a very beautiful way of explaining it, also because the word hikmah in Arabic, is al-ilmu nafi'u wal amalu bihi the good knowledge and you act on that knowledge and the sunnah is the actions of the Qur'an it's actually the Qur'an practically right so in that sense also al-kitab wal hikmah makes sense it's the practical application of the Qur'an okay uh, thank you and then we got a second question with the last one from Tansri Zahid Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alaikum brother Norman uh, thank you very much for such an enlightened lecture <clears throat> My question is nothing to do with hukum, with hakam. I, uh, I just, um, from your own perception, own background, uh, you have been, uh, I, I suppose you're born outside the, United, the US. You're now residing in the US. Am I right? Now, I notice that in this world today, the best Muslim, Muslim practices are not in the Muslim countries. They're all in the West. The perception I receive, the book that I that make my iman, uh, mantap means mantap means uh, no, my iman, iman. You know, the strength of my iman. Strengthened when I read a book written not by a Muslim at that time, by Maurice Bohail, the comparison of science, Quran, and. Uh, Bible. When I read that, it turned me out. It turned me upside down. Of course, Maurice became Muslim later. Now, the Muslim practices today, uh, and I see it, the lot of learned Muslims coming from the US and Europe, not from the traditional Muslim countries. And a lot of laws, like you said, being applied unreasonably. We just assume that there are laws, but these are coming from traditional Muslim countries. No, my question is, how come this has happened? Is it because you are residing in a non-Muslim majority country? You are a minority in, your, in that part of the world, and that we are on here, we were born Muslims. We think that that is what the law is all about. Or is it because of some other intellectual exercises they are in the education system and whatever. Okay. Thank you. That's a very heavy question. <laughs> but it's a really good question too. Um, I, I disagree with you, first of all. I think there are some incredible Muslims in the, in the Ummah everywhere. Uh, and I don't believe that Muslims in the West are better. I don't. If you came there, you would know. <laughs> 
but what I will say is that you, you do find very prominent thinkers and intellectuals and da'is and things like that coming more and more from the Western world, right? Um, and I'm just a small example of that, but much better than myself. Um, the reasons for that are many. One of those reasons is, I, I can only share personal ones with you. I was, you know, uh, uh, I was born in Germany. I spent a lot of my youth in, uh, in Saudi, of course a Muslim country. And when you're in a Muslim country, there's a blessing. Islam is all around you. But there's also a challenge. You don't question anything. It's just Islam. Everybody's Muslim, obviously. So you never think about Islam. It's just a part of your identity. When you go to America, and they question everything about you, why are you Muslim? Why are you dressed like that? Why do you pray? What, what is in your book? They start asking you all these questions. And these questions you never even ask yourself. <laughs> so you don't know how to answer these questions because you never had them yourself. And when you learned Islam, you did not learn Islam. Number one, if somebody asks you, why are you Muslim? Here's what you say and here's how you... You never learned this. You never learned it. And so I had to... First of all, I wasn't even interested in the religion. And when I did, I had to ask myself the same questions that non-Muslims ask. It's like I had to take shahada all over again to hold on to my Islam. Because I cannot live there, have all those questions, and say, mm, it's okay, I don't have any answers, but I'm still Muslim. I can't shut my brain off. Now I have to come to Islam intellectually. I have to come to Islam consciously. I would argue I was subconsciously Muslim, and now I have to become consciously Muslim. And then I realized something, that the, the, those questions that I was asked in America, or the society that challenged my Islam, that society has now made its way onto the internet. And now the Muslim Ummah is being asked those questions, wherever they are. So we're not safe anywhere. Which means we cannot be subconscious Muslims anywhere anymore. We can't afford it. We have to come to Islam consciously now and be confident in our Islam and have the right foundation of why is it that we are Muslim. We have to refresh Islam all over again like we just became Muslim. It is necessary. Before the internet, I would argue it was maybe easier for you to pass Islam from your grandfather to you, you know, to your father to you. It was easier. It is much harder for you to give it to your children. Guaranteed. Because they have Google. Which means they have questions. Which means they have questions you never had. And they will ask those questions. And there are some very hard questions. You know? We have to equip ourselves. So that's one of the reasons. We, we as a minority, if we're going to survive, we're, we had to answer those questions. And that builds confidence. The other thing is, how are you going to stay as a minority where everybody around you doesn't like Islam or they don't know anything about Islam and things like that? You have to become very strong in, your, in, in the confidence in your faith. And you have to become ambassadors of your faith. You cannot be on the defense. In a sense, you have to be on the offense. You have to stand up and speak for your faith if it's going to survive. And I've, I would argue that a lot of the Muslims in the West were put in that position. A lot of Muslims lost their faith. A lot of Muslims are no longer Muslim in the West. They're gone. I met somebody, it was incredible. I met somebody in Mexico, Mexico City. I went just once. And the this, this soon as I got to Mexico City, I did the most important thing. Look for a halal restaurant, right? <laughs> There's only two. <laughs> and I, there was a Moroccan restaurant not too far away. I went there. And I know a little bit of Spanish, I spoke to the brother, I found out that he's Moroccan. And we started speaking in Arabic a little bit, and he told me that there was a huge immigration of Arab Muslims that came to Mexico in 1960 and 1970s. Engineers. Hundreds of thousands. And I said, so where are they? Are there big masajid in Mexico? Are there... He goes, no, no, there's, there's one masjid, 200 people. I said, what happened to everybody else? Where did they go? 
He said they basically accepted Mexican culture. The first generation was fairly Muslim, but their children became very much assimilated with the larger society. Now you can't even tell. You can't even tell which ones of them are. They have some names like Muhammad or Ahmad and things like that, but other than that, you can't tell that they're Muslim. Subhanallah. In just six. something I would like to yeah. maybe answer one more question and then I'd like to stand in the back over there and let our mothers and daughters ask whatever questions they yeah. want without the mic it's okay okay but I'd like to because they, they usually never get a chance to speak to the, the you know the, the du'at and the speakers the imams yeah. so I'm, I'm I, I would love to take a selfie with you guys but we'll do that at the end I'll go in the back first and maybe speak to our mothers and our daughters first inshallah and then we'll come back okay but one more question from this brother and okay, okay. yeah be. Very short one, eh? All right, okay, please. Yo, tell, tell us your name. And... Uh, my name is Amar J.K. Al-Kolak. I'm a PhD student at University of Uttara Malaysia. Uh, now we have the extremists uh, who, are, who believe that we need to destroy everyone who is not following Islam, build it again from zero. And we have the others who believe in gradual transformation, which I agree with you, but you um, alim them which I believe uh, this is the safe way for and the logical way to transform what we have become after letting go our formula um, but my question is um, now we have governments that, and, and Arabic and Muslim countries uh, whom their population do not believe in them as leaders to transformation to become a leading Muslim countries. Uh, we all believe that uh, I'm Palestinian and I, I believe in as many of my colleagues or at my age uh, that our governments are not gonna bring us anywhere to become a leading Muslim countries mm -hmm. or back to Islam as it was and uh, to rule. Plus uh, the Western cultures that trying or in generally generally speaking they are pushing and trying to limit the, the Islamic, um, the, the other uh, sides of Islam that implies to lifestyles. So they're trying to limit Islam to masjids or to uh, halaqa or to whatever it is. They just keep it there. Don't do financial, Islamic financial, finance. Don't do um, Islamic business. They're trying to limit everything that, that can be a rival uh, uh, to their system. So how, the question is how do you see us Muslims all over the world with this everything happening uh, to get back on track and become a leading Muslim. Thank you very much. Another heavy question. Um, I'd like to share a quick story with you, my brother. Um, I was in Turkey uh, about a, a month and a half ago and as you know Turkey implemented extreme secularism after the fall of the the Uthmani state in 1924 and when they implemented extreme secularism um, things like hijab were banned um, and there was 
like some some very extreme measures were taken to even burn copies of Quran in some places. Tafasir were burnt. Um, people that had government jobs and if they had a beard, they had to shave their beard or lose their job. This is very very extreme situation in the and it's a Muslim country, and they went through this for the last ninety years almost. And they, uh, they tried to suppress Islam in every possible way. Every possible way. The, Turkey has some of the most beautiful masajid in the world. And you haven't heard the adhan there in so many years. You know? In the, like, it's an incredible change that was brought into that society to, to rip Islam out of that society. You're talking about leaving Islam inside the masjid and not dealing with economics or... They tried, they, did, they barely even let Islam inside the masjid. So it was far worse. And when I went to Turkey a few weeks ago, I heard the Adhan. And when I went to Turkey a few weeks ago, I saw people in government buildings say salam to each other. They could lose their job for saying salam by the way. And now they're saying salam to each other. And they're discussing, and I, I, I met a historian, I cannot forget her story, it's so incredible. She's a historian of the Uthmani Khilafah, uh, she's a grandmother herself. And she told me a story of her grandmother. Her grandmother used to work in government when the, the government changed from Islamic government to secular, extreme secular government. And she used to memorize Quran. And she used to wear hijab. And she was told you have to take your hijab off. And she was some head of education office, some big role in government. She said, I'm not going to take my hijab off. So they changed her job from, you know, chancellor of education or something, to janitor, cleaning service. You know, they moved her down. Just because she wouldn't take her hijab off. Then they wanted to come door to door to check who has copy of Quran, so they could burn it. So she hid her copy of the Quran under the, you know, in her barn where they keep the animals, she hid it under the, the hay so that they wouldn't find it. And she would go into there and she would recite her Qur'an and she would not bring it out from there because they'll find out. And this is where the animals do, you know, their filth. And that's where she keeps her mushaf. And she, the, the granddaughter told me, who's now herself an older woman, she told me she still has that copy of Qur'an, she keeps it inside of a bag because if she opens the bag, the whole house smells like animal, you know what, you know? This is where they came from, but were they able to get rid of the Qur'an or get rid of Islam? No. They were able to hold it down for almost 90 years and then it just popped back up again. And now young people there are in the masajid. It's, in, it's something beautiful to see. They're learning Arabic. I mean, they're, it's when I saw the Syrian refugees in, in Turkey, Wallahi, I remembered Muhajirun and Ansar. Wallahi al-Azim. It was incredible. In, I've never seen anything like it. They will, there are places in the Muslim world where Islam itself is being pushed down. In my personal opinion, you do not have to agree with this. In my personal opinion, our job is not to rebel against government agencies and fight against them and do in my personal opinion, it has only produced more bloodshed. In my personal opinion, a, a grassroots teaching of Islam. Because the real tragedy of Islam is not political to me. The real tragedy of Islam is not economic. The real tragedy of Islam is intellectual and spiritual. When young people are no longer convinced that Islam is the truth. What is happening in the Arab world? Masjid is empty, mall is full. That's the, not the places where there's war happening, the places that are safe right now. Where are the youth? Where are the young people? They are, and, and most of them, if you even talk to them a little bit about Islam, they get annoyed, they get angry. And that's in the Muslim world. That is the ultimate emergency of Islam. Our problem is not governments. Our problem is not secularism. That's not our problem. How did we get there? There were these people who are running the governments now and believe in these things now. One, once upon a time, they were youth. And when they were youth, they did not receive yatlu alayhim ayatihi wa yuzakihim. And that's what brought them over there. 
If we don't think about the next hundred, we keep thinking about what's happening right now. We have to think what's going to happen in a hundred years. If we don't produce a change in thinking, then you will not see a change. You cannot, and even if you change and you fight and you win, you didn't change the thinking of people. Which means they'll come back again. And you'll go back again, and they'll come back again, and you'll go back again. The, the real battle is the battle of thought, the battle of influence. And that battle can only be won by the Qur'an, I would argue. That can only be won by the Qur'an. And people who say you can bring immediate change, if immediate change could be brought, it would have been brought by Rasulullah himself wasallam. There is no such thing as an immediate change. There's no such thing, there's only chaos, there's only safkud dima, that's all that it brings. And that, that's my position on the issue, inshaAllah. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Numan. And uh, with that, I uh, would like to end the session. And uh, then after Salah, inshaAllah, Brother Numan will stand behind and then we might have some sure. uh, furthermore question and answer, inshaAllah. So I'll pass to Brother Zaki. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.